when I'm creating work, I don't want to put myself in a box and become a stereotype of myself. By taking chances, my work's changed and evolved. As we give everything so freely to the public, you know, people don't remember it. Whatever it is, if you want to do it, the only person that's stopping you is yourself. My name is Steph Bastian. In my 10 years on the road, I've met many unique characters in the tattoo business, and they all have one thing in common, incredible stories. Stories of past times, personal growth, priceless experience, and of course, bizarre happenings. I want to share those stories with you. This is Tattoo Tales. How are you? Doing good, how are you doing? First of all, thank you for being here, yeah, even if it's yeah. virtual. Stoke. So, you from... LA. Is that where you were born and raised? Uh, I was born in a small town upstate New York. Um, through tattooing, uh, I met a girl. We started dating and I moved down here to open a shop with her. So you grew up in New York or, or, or in that area? Yeah, kind of in the country, like city, suburb country. Did you have like a formal education in art? Uh, I went to art school in my mid-20s. Um, I, you know, I focused on art high school, uh, in high school, I did like, um, tech trade school, like senior year, we got to pick a trade and I picked commercial art, you know, I was into superheroes. So that was my focus. Like uh, comic stuff. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to be an anchor for comic books. And when did you get into more like oil painting and more like serious? Um, like 20. Five, twenty-six, twenty-seven years old. And then, did you did you follow up on that? Did you did you go to university or? I did. Yeah, I went to a private school in upstate New York, and then I went to a art school in Florida, where I really kind of fell, fell in love with painting. And how did you tattoo enter your life? How did you start to be connected to it? In, into tattoos. Yeah. Uh, I got my first tattoo at sixteen. There was a local biker shop in town. I would draw a flash for that guy. You know, I was into superheroes, so I was getting tattooed here and there. Uh, I had a friend who I looked up to. He was a couple years on, older than me, um, Brian Bancroft. Uh, he was a great artist, a great tattooer. It wasn't something that I was necessarily interested in as a career until my late 20s, early 30s. So you were still in that town or you moved somewhere else by then? Uh, no, I was in Florida, and then I moved to San Francisco. Okay, so you've been around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And how did you find the Bay Area? Because I lived in San Jose for a little while, like years, like 10 years ago or something. And my own perception of it is that that area, like San Francisco, San Jose a bit less, but still that Bay Area is so, is so alive with, I don't know, inspiration, so to speak. Like you, you go to a bar. And you meet one guy's in a band, another one is programming software, another one makes tattoos, yeah. a guy's a skater, a guy's a graffiti. Yeah, yeah there's, there's so many creative people there. Uh, when, I, when I moved there, it was a big art community. I moved there specifically to kind of engage in that community. And, you know, the strength of tattooing there, tattooers are just, just as large a part of the art community as any other art form. Who was your favorite in those times over there? You know, there was the big names there. In you know, the people that I met in the beginning, pretty much. Uh, Grimy, Jason Condell, Marcus Pacheco, um, Mike Davis, um, Henry Lewis. He, you know, he was probably my biggest influence. I shared a studio with him pretty soon after I moved there. He's the reason why I got into tattooing. Nice. I don't know the guy personally. That he's he was in the project now, so we speak. Yeah. Both, we spoke uh, briefly, but I saw him like a couple of times with with common friends in conventions, and he looks like a funny guy. He's a fun dude. Yeah, I so saw they have to yeah, party yeah. dancing and stuff. Henry he Henry like, brings all the fun. So you got you got to know all the very good people right from the start. From uh, more of the '90s generation, yeah. I didn't I didn't necessarily meet the older generation of tattooers till a few years later. How were those times? It was really exciting. Um, you know, I moved there as a painter, and then I was teaching at a couple art schools there. It was a close, tight-knit art community, and it was 
inspiring and really exciting. Uh, it's, I was in my early 30s. Um, I started tattooing at 35. Uh, I'll be 50 this year. And it was just a lot of changes, a lot of new things, a lot of amazing people. I became friends with, I, I had some friends in college that had also moved there and they hooked up with a bunch of friends and started a company called Massive Black. They also had a website called conceptart.org. Um, and I traveled around with those guys for years, uh, teaching different countries, um, uh, drawing, painting. There's a lot of digital stuff. They were going around doing like a events, seminars and stuff like that. Educational workshops, mostly with people that work in video games and then a handful of painters. How are those guys? Because I imagine video game people to be a different breed. <laughs> like, really? um, they're all free spirits, man. They're all uh, stoked to get to draw pictures for a living. They're, they're awesome. Because they must think on a different level. I was watching this new series the other day on Netflix, which is kind of nice. It's called Russian Doll. And basically yeah. it's the story of this. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you Vasquez. He's yeah, on that the, show. Yeah, she can't die and stuff. And... Uh, one thing that struck me is that she designed video games and at some point uh -huh. they tried to figure out this loop where her and this dude are in that they can't die, they keep living again and again. Yeah. And then she start comparing that to video game and quantum reality. Yeah. So she's like, oh yeah, because I draw video games, I had to think in four dimensions. So she starts to get into that quantum way of seeing things, you know, and then the four dimension time. And, and, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm like, do people that design think, video games think that way? I think people that work in video games are probably some of the most versatile artists out there because they have to think of three dimensional space and they have to think about things that don't exist in life, in nature, or, you know, they're making something up that is existing in, a non, in an unreal world. And still have to make sense. Yeah. In their world, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like you say, it must be very free, you know, because you don't have yeah. all the restrictions that you have with other mediums. So you're like, okay, you know, now we're going to do this that is going to do that. And they get to play and they get to wear a lot of hats. They get they get to do the role of, you know, a fashion designer and a shoe designer and a weapons designer and a vehicle designer and an and architect. And yeah. All, all of it. Yeah. It's pretty, wow. pretty incredible. So you travel around with these guys for a while. Yep. And then came back to San Francisco, or uh, they were based in San Francisco, but we mm. we did lots of cities. We did Berlin, we did um, we did Austin. Uh, where the hell did we go? Fucking everywhere. Uh, we went to Prague. That was pretty amazing. They did New Zealand. I didn't do that trip. Um, they they've been all over the world. What's your favorite so far in Europe? Prague was pretty amazing. Um, I mean, it was just for that trip. It was my only trip there. Japan is definitely, I was married to a Japanese lady for several years and got to visit that country quite a bit with the locals. So, you know, I have some fond memories of that place. Italy is amazing. I like everywhere. <laughs> Funny thing is that like every place is, is beautiful in its own way. Yeah. You know, like I've been on the road for more than 10 years and at first I was looking for the perfect place. Yeah. You know, because I like the sun, so I go to Spain, and then I go to California, yeah. and then I go to Australia. And then now, years down the line, it's like, you know what? You realize that it's not a perfect place, but then every place has something that you like, like Scandinavia has that, and then that. Yeah. You know? So it's so yeah, much yeah, 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 yeah. so much variety. So then you, then you went back to San Francisco more on a stable base, I guess, after this traveling, 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 because I get that's, that gets enough as well after a while, right? I think I switch doing that to doing more tattoo conventions mm. and uh how is it now how is your balance now between paintings and tattooing at the moment it's always fluctuating um i paint six seven nights a week i tattoo about 12 people a month you know i'm in the shop it's going to change probably when we get back to it but i'm in the shop four or five days a week uh if i'm not tattooing i'm Helping with things, ordering supplies, stocking stations, cleaning something, drawing, you know, doing whatever. I like being in the tattoo shop. You know, it feels like home there. The good thing, I guess, is that the two forms are quite different. So perhaps painting can get you away from tattooing and vice versa, right? Because Completely so different. different. Completely different. Your painting is very, I guess, meditative, especially if you paint at nights and stuff, right? 
but I can stop whenever I want. There's no schedule to it. Tattooing for me is definitely more of an occupation in the sense that I go somewhere to do a thing and engage with a person on a schedule that's pre predefined, you know, where I can just pick up and I can pick up and paint at any second. I can turn around right now and just start painting. And I see on the back you have uh, the light tunnel painting. Oh, yeah, I've been working on this for a while. You're going to have an exhibition, right? It was for June 13th with two friends, um, and it got postponed to January next year. Does it have a specific concept, or is it just like a, regarding a, a certain production of a certain time of yours? When I do shows, it's usually a series based off the last couple to few years of life experience. Um, this exhibition will be a lot of images inspired by being around Lyle. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with him the last couple of years, and I want to celebrate him and share to the world what I can with, you know, the images that I took in his presence and reflecting and painting, making something that kind of honors him and where he comes from and who he is. So there's, you know, there's a bit of that. The, you know, the last few years, I've also kind of tried to focus more on the elder generation of tattooers. And I've been engaged with enough people, I think, where uh, tattooers are my friends. And I want to share with the world a personal experience based off that friendship. I got to take some great photos of Bill Simon a few months before he passed. Um I'd done some paintings of Bill in the past, but I had been asking him for a couple of years to take some nude photos. And a couple of months before he passed, he's like, hey, I think I'm ready to take some photos. And in the shop, you know, we've got some great images there. And I've been working on that for, oh man, probably a year and a half. I got my times screwed up. I don't know how long it's been. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, but I admit, I, it's, this is the first time I haven't been showing a lot of the things I've been working on. As we give everything so freely to the public, people don't remember it, you know, and, and I want to hold on to these things before they're finished and spend my own time with them and figure things out on my own and just be with that painting and be with that person in the painting um, before I just, you know, share a little square that people can like and make comments about, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, imagine that somebody, you know, many people haven't met Lyle in person and Bill, right? What if you would have to share your impression, your perception of, of them to somebody that doesn't, that don't, didn't know them? What would you say? Because you got close to them. The personality comes through in conversation and in being in their presence. And and how do you how do you show it in a painting? If I can show an image that reflects a mood and hopefully a light and a, you know, a feeling like in the painting of Bill, I'm using a certain kind of color palette in the background that if you know Bill, when you see it, it's fitting. My job as a painter in as many things as I've made of tattooers is to document our community in a way that nobody's doing. And I have to honor these individuals and not rush through them at times and do the best that I can with them, you know, and whatever that is, whatever comes out of that. What would you say was the most beautiful trait of them that stuck with you? I met Bill pretty early on when I moved to San Francisco. Um, I lived close to Diamond Club, so I had met Bill and Juni early on, and he was always generous with his time and energy he always had stories he always had advice on little things in life and was a great guy because he just shared himself honestly with everybody he met and he wasn't afraid to be himself you know nor was lyle with lyle he what he's like no human i had met i've ever met in my life he's lived ten thousand lives he's experienced more than any human could imagine to experience He's gone through, you know, through the different generations and he's got the, he had the memory and the stories of those times and he documented that stuff. It's, it's a rare quality for somebody to have the, their own knowledge of their own personal history and knowledge of world history and knowledge of tattoo history and to have gone out and experienced this history and written the history. Lyle's a special guy, you know, I, Hank is... He's been doing that for as long as he's been 
engage in tattooing. You know, he's another figure in the community who's helped inspire the, the world and, and let the world know that tattooing is, you know, where it's been and where it comes from and where it's going and who's been a part of it and what's been created in the context of that history and, you know, why things are a certain way and, you know, why you, you put a tattoo on a certain way and why that design is this way. Like, it's such a dense, immense history that you can't learn it in a month, a year, 10 years. Nice. Lyle, man, you know, he went through the sexual revolution and he went, he went through war and he went through, he would have loved what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he would, he, you know, he'd been complaining about it, but it would just be another story to tell, you know, like, yeah. Like what you're saying makes me think of Doc Price as well. Yeah. You know, a guy that was tattooing soldiers during the war and stuff, you know, like a yeah, million, yeah. million stories. We don't want those stories to get lost. I have a friend in Rome, which got close to Lyle uh, by, you know, in his last times. So he would go to his house in Rome and spend some some weeks there, whatever, and relax. And, and this friend of mine, because I asked him, like, how was he? And he said, I said, listen, man, he would wake up in the morning, you know, and he would live his life like he would be like 16. Yes. And he said, you know, and he would say, yeah. obviously now people tell me, no, you got to rest, you got to do this, you got to do that because yeah. you were sick, whatever. And he's like, yeah. fuck that. He said that he lived, you know, riding that wave till the very end. You know, yeah. I'm like, man, that's, uh, you know, that's not for everybody. You know, he, wa he wasn't worried about being politically correct, but he was an asshole. You know, he, he's seen, he had seen everything. He, if he made statements that were hard for people to, to listen to, he would always back it up with fact and knowledge, you know, or if it's a joke, he'd remind you that this is a joke and I'm not some, you know, scummy dirtbag. I'm, I'm just a dude who's having a great time. He's speaking right, oh, yeah. speaking right behind you. you know? So he's, it's, it's funny because it, it really looks like he's there with you. you know? yeah. so it's very cool yeah. to listen to that. I'm glad that he's here. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> And um, talking about your paintings and stuff, how do you think that your way of painting evolved? Uh, I think, you know, my interests are pretty broad in the visual art, specifically in the painting arts. Like, I love realism. I love abstraction. I love surrealism. I like all different kinds of painting. Um, I don't have one specific painter or one artist where it's like, this is my favorite you know, artists, and this is how I want my work to look. And when I'm creating work, I don't want to put myself in a box and become a stereotype of myself. I've constantly, over the years, have branched out into different ways of producing something with the inspiration of an influence to try to get somewhere that I hadn't been before. Sometimes that'll lead me into other things or I'll pursue that further and see what road that takes me down. A lot of friends I have are purists in tattooing and in painting where, well, if you're an Americana tattooer, can't do anything else. Or if you're a, a realist painter, you, you should only work from life. And if you don't work from life, and you work from photos and you're not a real artist. There's the extremes of, of opinions and attitudes in all art forms. And I don't want to put myself in a box like that and, you know, seclude myself or, or hide the potential of stumbling into something that I never could imagine that I would try, if that makes sense. I want to play. I like art. I want, I want to try new things. I like stuff that looks like stuff. I want it to be believable to the viewer at times. I like to render things. I like uh, the idea of objects in space and creating an illusion with, you know, a two-dimensional surface, creating an environment with that, with that image. I think over the years, just by taking chances, my work's changed and evolved. I think it's about courage as well. Like you, you said, taking chances. I think that's a very good word because courage of putting yourself out there and try and fail rather than stick to what you know, which you will know that is going to be a success because you know how to do that. And you know that people like it, you know you're going to look good. But I think it takes as well a bit of courage to try different things and unexplored territories, so to speak, visually, so that you can advance even at risk of, oh, you know what, that doesn't look good. 
or people didn't like it. Sometimes they don't look good. <laughs> you got yeah. you got to be okay with it. Yeah. Um, I produce a lot of a lot of pictures, so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna make some fucking duds. And yeah, that's, that's the okay. point. Right? Sometimes the way I see it, you know, it's the outcome, the painting or the tattoo or whatever. The tattoo is different because obviously you have a customer and a commission and stuff. But especially if you talk about artworks, I think it's almost sometimes a, a byproduct of your process rather than the opposite. So it's not. The goal is not the artwork, but the goal is your own path of self-discovery, so to speak, or discovery of things and people and places. And then the the byproduct of that experience is the artwork. You know what I mean? And oh. I think when you take it that way, it's more genuine because otherwise you're focused on, on the result rather than the process. And then it's always more like constrictive and limiting because you're more obsessed by the result, if that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And uh, this answer will change, you know, now in a month, in two weeks, in a year. But if you would have to think about some names, right, of, of people that you saw recently somewhere on the internet or you met or magazines or whatever, artworks, and you really liked it, like, oh, that kind of stuck with me somehow for some reason. You know, a picture from this guy, a painting from that person. Yeah. Who, who would that be? I can tell you right now. Um, shit, where is this? I just found... What's this guy today? No, last night. Norman Charles Blamey. Okay. Um, he was a painter from uh, the 18, mid 1800s to 19, early 1900s. Norman Charles Blamey, B L A M E Y. I stumbled on his stuff last night and was blown away by it. What um, kind of stuff is kind it? Of gra- it's graphic. They're figures that are kind of realistic. Um, there, his palette's a little muted palette. His work has moods to it. They're figurative paintings. Um, people in environments with objects, they're, they're, the anatomy is, it looks like he's drawing them. Um, some of them are a little bit more representational and some of them are not at all, but they're not cartoony. Um, there's still a sense of realism to them. Uh, even in the really graphic ones where the, you know, the colors are kind of flat, uh, he's really, um, what I do like about what he's doing is you can really see the form in his work. Like the structure. Yeah. The different planes of a, of a solid object or like a fabric or whatever that object is made of. It has a certain sheen to it that gives it the illusion of the texture of that material. Um, and he's turning the planes of that object with flat colors of paint and it it looks it looks cool um one of my favorite painters uh uh yuan lugo uglo u-g-l-o-w he did that solely like he just focused on form um and the subject matter was still lives and figures it was more about the pursuit of capturing form in space and he worked from life and he was obsessive in them having that physical form um, you know who's doing crazy work is that guy mike dorsey yeah man that guy's <laughs> you know like sometimes when he when he paint he i was, was out of control with a, man he's insane man in a good in a good way obviously yeah, yeah i yeah. was stuck here with a friend of mine len from from bruges and uh, he was showing me some picture of of that he post Mike post about his uh, art space and stuff, and he was saying he was telling me how how obsessed he is, yeah, you know how his life it. yeah, rotates. It. It, it, it's like the, the amount of stuff he produced is ridiculous. He mm-hmm. he makes like one painting a day or something, you know. Yeah. And they're all yeah, yeah. obviously his technique is very loose, but still is is insane and. The cool thing is that I started following him like a few years ago. Uh-huh. And so you could see the evolution mm-hmm. until to a point where maybe, I don't know, a couple of years ago, something it's almost like something clicked and he found his his way of doing things. Yeah. And you can, which now makes you say, okay, you see it right away. And without yeah. knowing it, you know, it's him, yeah. right? Well, and but, the thing with Mike too is he's got his own ideas. Yeah, his own approach. And I love because as well, I know him a little bit because I met him a couple of times at convention. That's about it. But yeah. I love the fact that he has a pronounced sense of humor. Oh, yeah. And you can and you can see that in his paintings, you know? Oh, yeah. And I love it because this is my own personal opinion, but a painting is, is good when it's technically well done and expressive. But I think the extra 
uh, value to it is when there is it carries the soul of the artist, you know, Absolutely. which makes you, which you know, the painting will produce something, and it gives you a feeling about that something has been reproduced, which I think is the the accomplishment of the artwork. So it's not just a picture, but then on top of that, you have the extra layer where you can feel the soul of the artist and be like, oh, this is a funny guy, this is a sad guy, this totally. guy was totally crazy, you know, like. So yeah, the guy is. He's got a say. wild mind. <laughs> oh man! And just seeing the paint, the pictures of his workspace, it's proper chaotic energy, you know, stuff everywhere, and it reminds me of you know these like bohemian painters of turn of the century kind of thing, uh-huh. you know, that they, they lived in this atelier full of stuff, and there was this creative energy, you know, it wasn't structured right. at all, just like blah, you know, right? And it, even just looking at it, at least me, it makes me inspired. It's like wow, you know, totally. It's not, it's not sterile. My desk looked like a fucking Ikea desk when I had one, you know, so <laughs> perfect. You know? I'm like, oh, I gotta be more like that. Yeah. And uh, where do you see your painting going in the future? Like if you would have yeah. to take a, a guess. Uh, uh, I think I've been going there slowly the last couple of years and I need to need and want to pursue this more. Traveling and spending more time with specific tattooers in their homes, in their workspaces, you know, spending days, weeks with them, and just getting to know them as individuals, um, and then reflecting, you know, paintings from those experiences. Like, that's that's where I want to go. Um, you know, there's images that I want to make. I, I haven't done them yet out of not feeling prepared. Um, I want to do, you know, some convention images where it's a group scene or a party scene um with different individuals engaged in conversation and you know i've I've approached them a little bit but they're they're still kind of surface level where they they could just be pushed so much further Uh, i have for this exhibition coming up next year now some environment landscape uh interior setting paintings from lyle's place um so it's less about, you know, that person and, and some of the objects and situations in their in their home life. Um, I really want to pursue that. I think it's important, you know. Yeah. And and like we were saying before, it reflects your change. Yeah. Your, your own view yeah. on on things. When you look at even paintings from the painters from the past, you can see, you know, the parallel of their art and their view on life. You know, it's almost like your written or visual philosophy. Yeah. So it's nice. It's like your your own evolution. And uh, is there any other mediums that you are curious to try, you would like to try, maybe you haven't had the time, or like, oh, I would like to try that, even just for the fun of it? Or... I haven't sculpted in probably 20 years. Uh, it would be nice to jump into that a little bit. I did a, a bit of printmaking in college. Uh, that was fun to do. I think just painting more. I like painting big. Uh I would love to paint more nudes. You know, unfortunately, I, I've used myself a number of times over the years, and that's just because I'm an easy model. My girlfriend doesn't want to do it, and yeah. I want to document tattooers' tattoos in the three dimension in a way that's not just a static image of them. Uh, I don't know if you saw a painting I did a Shige, uh, yeah. um, where he's standing, you know, and it's just different views of him standing. Angle. from the camera that one point perspective i would love to do things that are just a lot more involved and it's finding the right individuals who would be interested in collaborating on something like that uh, i did a nude of joe harrison uh, in 2008 and that just happened through chance um, but i want to push the figure outside of just what it looks like in a photo you know i want to ex- explore the flesh tattoo with paint and break it outside of just this is an arm and this is a tattoo on an arm i want to expand on that and make something that i can't imagine to make how how do you think you could achieve that if you if you ideally would have you know freedom with the subjects and with anything else how, how do you think you could achieve that it's more like a dynamic environment or like people in motion i think finding individuals who would be willing to heavily tattooed individuals that are 
parts of our community that, you know, their tattoos have historical meaning and they have historical meaning and then doing something to expand on their image in a way that hasn't been seen before, but still honoring the tattoos that they have in a way where it's, it's about that person. It's about their figure. It's about their tattoos, but it's not just a copy of a photograph that makes sense. Hmm. It's finding the right people. It's an interesting, uh, quest you gotta find the right person and the right yeah i think it's 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 a fun journey yeah i've done it a little bit with with myself but i you know i'm using a a camera and a tripod and using a timer so i'm i'm getting taking images and then going back to look at the look at the images on the computer and then reposing myself and you know i don't work with any assistants or anything and i don't necessarily want to do that but to be behind the camera and be able to do that with a heavily tattooed tattooist would be ideal. What would be, what do you think is the, how do you say, the obstacle, the hardest thing that is limiting you from that? It's more like the attitude of the people. You're looking for a specific kind of mindset and people that can be free in front of a camera and stuff like that? Or? I should take pictures of people more and I don't get to know people more before I ask them to take a photo of them to make a painting. And a lot of times it's it's in a social setting and it's not a it's 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 just too immediate and it's just it's it's having those conversations with individuals and finding somebody who would be like, dude, I, I, I like this idea. I have some ideas to bring to the table, you know, and they'd be willing to go on that path, you know. And uh, what are your next plans? for the immediate future. Apart, obviously, everything is in hold now because the world stopped, but do you have any, apart from the exhibition? Painting, hanging out with my girlfriend, uh, petting cats, um, riding my bicycle. Um, was supposed to go to Seattle convention in August. I don't know if that's happening or who knows what the world's going to be like then. Just trying to stay positive and spending more time making these paintings better than I can make them with more time. Do you find that this quarantine help you or, or the opposite? Like, because you have to paint and anyways, a process that takes a long time and you used to be on your own painting. Do you think that, you know, it's something that you, you could use usefully for your productions? Like, Oh, I have to stay at home. It's been awesome. It's been awesome. It's been very productive. You know, we, we hadn't in the past really ate, eaten dinner at home much, eaten meals at home. And now, you know, my girlfriend's cooking every day and it's been nice. Feel like a normal, normal person. <laughs> like a normal couple. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it's been good. Because you have crossed paths with so many people and as well like Lyle, you know, people that had crazy lives. You know. Can you think about an advice or something that you learned by experience? that happened and and got stuck with you and you find yourself going back to that advice or that lesson that you learned that proved very valuable for you? I think we all have our own individual personalities. I think we all have our specific personal traits. I think, you know, some people are uh, hyper-focused. Some people are super relaxed. Uh, I think for myself, as I've gotten older and experienced quite a few things, the, the things that I believe more and more and, and understand is like the best mindset for myself is to understand who, uh, who I am as an individual and embrace who I am and to not be afraid to be myself. As an, an artist in general, like in a, in a man or a boy, I don't think about finances and money much and, you know, saving money for future and taxes and you know, being responsible with that stuff. It's taken me many years to kind of be better with that. I know I need money to live, but I don't want to think about it. And I don't want to make pictures for the sake of making a living. Like I want to do what I want to do. And I don't want to have to think about how I'm going to survive financially. And I've been fortunate enough that, you know, I do a lot of things that don't make me money, but I do enough things that that I do get enough income that supports me to make pictures that can be whatever I want them to be. They don't have to be for sale and they don't 
have to be directed by this idea of commerce and and I can play and I can not show them and I can just just make something for the sake of making it you know a lot of a lot of tattooers will say well I don't I'm afraid to paint or I don't have time to do it it's it, it comes down to whatever it is if you want to do it the only person that's stopping you is yourself and whatever those things that you say you want to do just go out and do them and I'm you know I'm I'm fortunate again like my girlfriend we've been together 12 years now and she's got my back she doesn't give me a hard time for me wanting to be me you know and I, I think relationships are difficult especially as a as an artist who wants to make things that don't make them money like it's hard to live that way especially if you're living your life with other people and if you have a family and children you know you can't disregard all those things or it's going to fall apart so it's finding a balance whatever that balance is um, it's gotten a lot better over the years and um, tattooing's amazing you know we can travel the world and we can engage in our community and we can live any kind of life we want to live it's, it's it's our choice you know and what is that for you as as your own individual it's interesting because a friend of mine once told me uh it's more of a buddhist thing but he said the heart doesn't think you cannot think in terms of money because money is a concept made up by man right yeah. and i guess when that's your like you were saying when that's your first priority you don't flow and your painting is not going to be you you know, all this extra value that we've been talking about that you want to put in it, yeah. they're going to be just filtered through the lenses of automatically, even if it's subconscious, like, okay, is this group of people will like this? So you already yeah. have to filter it and mold it to yeah. their likings. So you have yeah. to kind of like, it's funny because you shape your art and your art shapes you, which means that if you're producing art that way, you're already influencing yourself automatically, subconsciously because you're censoring yourself, you know? So just by producing that in that limited way, then you're limiting yourself too because you're not expressing and then perhaps you might become ingrained in you and then one day you wake up and you're that person. Yeah. You know, you molded the person that they want you to be. Totally. To your art. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you found like a good uh, balance, you know, that, that can allow you, like you say. And when I'm doing something for, for money, if it's a, commission or a commercial job i know that's what it's for and i'm stoked on it it's like all right i'm going to make this for that specific approach and that's what it is and it's i'm choosing to do that and it's allowing me to have a decent life you know what's there to complain about <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah, first world problems yeah and, man. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you could like somehow magically uh, talk to yourself with the things that you know now right with trials and errors and failures and lessons and with the things that you know now if you could go back to your 16 years old self and you could yeah. give yourself an advice with the perspective you have now what would you tell yourself um it doesn't matter what other people think don't spend your money on shit you don't need. Save your money for future goals. Um, have fun. That's it. <laughs> it's funny how that stuff, it could be useful as well to keep telling ourselves every day now as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, right? Totally. totally. Like, like a mantra. Awesome. Sean, that was uh, that was very nice. Thank you very much oh, for, yeah. the, for the course, time. Oh, yeah. Hey, for welcome. the time, you know, picking your brain. And thank you for being part of the project. Um, it was very thanks nice. for asking. It's amazing it how nice. much money you guys raise. Fucking awesome. It's crazy like how, yeah, the impact that you can have when you put together a group that is motivated on one yeah. common goal, which is, oh, yeah. you know, hopefully a good goal. It's yeah. a strong community. It's, a, it's an yeah. amazing community. Yeah, we're all nice. fortunate to, to know each other. Thank you very much oh, for, yeah. the, for the course, time. Oh, yeah, of course, man. Hey, for welcome. The time, you know.